All right, so the New England Patriots season has come to an end, uh, losing up in Buffalo on a cold Saturday night. Uh, Evan can attest to that. <laughs> as uh, the Patriots go down big to the Buffalo Bills, and the season uh, again is over. It's on to free agency and the draft. Uh, Evan, we talked about the possible outcome being this way, not the score. Didn't think it would get carried away that much. But the fact that they've been getting off to slow starts, uh, the fact that had they mentally reached their goals already, right. the Bills, their goals, they weren't accomplished on Saturday night. They're still, right. Their goal it probably isn't even accomplished if they beat the Chiefs this weekend. Yeah. They want to get to the Super Bowl. And I think we saw that all come to fruition on Saturday night. Yeah, you know, it's there's a couple of things that really stood out to me about this game. But first and foremost, just watching these two teams in warmups, you could tell the difference between the focus, the energy, the want to, all those types of things. The Bills, they came running out of their tunnel. You know, everybody screaming, everybody hollering, tons of energy, guys sprinting around <laughs> the field, you know, just... Uh, I can't even describe it. The difference between watching the bills and how jacked up they were for this game versus watching the other end of the field for the Patriots and kind of seeing new England more or less going through the motions at the other end of the field. And right away, I'm not a big body language doctor guy because I think sometimes you can get tricked by that. But right away, I did make a mental note of it, and I said, huh, one of these teams look, looks like they're in the playoffs. The other one of these teams looks like they don't want to be here, right? And that's exactly how it ended up playing out. And I think the two things that you look at are that, the lack of leadership, the lack of energy, the lack of desire, uh, just the lack of, or I guess, the inability to elevate your game from a regular season sure. setting to a playoff setting. And I think that speaks to maybe a bigger issue at hand here with the Patriots in terms of leadership, both on a player level, maybe even on a coaching level, not talking about the highest of levels with Bill Belichick, but coordinator level, position coach level. Are these guys, the leaders of the team, Devin McCourty, Matthew Slater, uh, are these guys getting through to the team the same way that maybe they were a couple years back. And I think you look at something that Mac Jones said after the game, which is year one, he didn't want to step on any toes, right? He was a rookie. He was going to let the veteran leaders lead the way, the McCordys, the Slaters, the Judons, the High Towers, uh, those guys to set the tone and take over the team. But he said that he wants in year two to become more of the leader of the team and what he mentioned was lead the way and kind of take guys with me, right? Sure. Pull the, the team with me. And I think what he was hinting at was I came to play. Like I came to compete with Buffalo. I'm, I'm in the opening drive. I'm making third down plays. I'm making throws down the field. I'm coming out and I'm trying to be aggressive. I'm trying to put us in a position to win. And he's got guys dropping passes. He's got guys not fighting for the ball. Nelson Aguilar on the deep ball. It wasn't the best throw in the world, but it was a catchable ball. And Nelson Aguilar sat there and tried to just wait on the ball. And Micah Hyde ends up making the more aggressive play on the football in the air. And that's why that pass was intercepted. You got guys on defense mailing it in, essentially, in a lot of ways on that side of the football. And I think Mac Jones... It would behoove Mac Jones going into year two to, ha to have a little asshole in him sometimes, right? Sure. To, to light a fire under the team sometimes. And I always try not to do this, but the gold standard is Tom Brady for any quarterback, whether it's New England or it's not. Everybody's looking at a guy like Brady as the, as the gold standard of how to play that position. And I can't tell you how many times in 20 years with Tom Brady – that I can remember Brady blowing up on the sideline when the team started flat and just going up and down the entire bench and saying, what the F guys yeah. wake up. It's the playoffs. We're down two touchdowns already. We've already put ourselves in this hole. What the F is going on out there? Like wake up. I remember yep. after 28 to three and the, 
second quarter, third quarter, he's going up and down the sideline and he's saying, we got to play harder. We got to play tougher. We got to play smarter. We got to play faster. And he's, you know, trying to get everybody to buy into the, the comeback and, and buy into the, the effort that they had to put out there. And then of course you have the greatest comeback in NFL history on the heels of that. So going into year two with Mac, there's, there are things on the field that maybe he needs to improve and, and he'll work on and things like that. But leadership I think is a big question mark right now for this Patriots team and maybe some of these veteran leaders like a Hightower like a McCourty like a Slater who are all free agents this offseason could be guys that they're looking to move on from and and pass the torch to the next guard of this team because maybe those guys have hit a wall in their careers and I think that's a big number one thing before we get into the number two thing which is roster talent yes. and just the fact that they're just not good enough no. as a football team right now number one i look at it and i say you don't have to have the best roster ever to not lose by 30 points in the playoffs like there that's a effort thing that's a want to thing that's a drive that's a leadership thing first and foremost before you get into any football conversations about the team whatsoever and that's not surprising to hear mac take that attitude because of the fact that, I mean, even look at Brady, Brady didn't start out, you know, firing up his teammates in his first year or two. It took a while. And and I think you're spot on when it's time to, because these guys are older as well. Yeah. I mean, they're not Tom Brady. So they respect the players. They've won championships, but still, like you said, are, 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 is that message not getting across? And is it not getting across also because of the fact that, They've won so many times. They've won so many championships. How much more, how much desire do they truly have compared to a Mac Jones and some of the new guys to the roster that have never won championships, that have the desire? So I can absolutely see that being the case. And that's probably why the Patriots will have to, it'll be interesting what kind of juggling act they do with free agency and the roster turnover of the soft season. Which veterans are they going to let go almost like for the for the purpose of trying to move that leadership over to another fraction of the team not because they don't feel like that player is worth it or worthy or couldn't help the team but almost like we've got to we've got to expedite this uh, culture change here a little bit faster and in order to do that you know we get some of the older veterans are going to leave We'll bring in some other veterans or we'll leave some other veterans on the staff, obviously, on the team. But those guys, maybe the bridge will will, will be shrunk from maybe 15 years uh, to about eight or seven, a little bit more reasonable age limit. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a good point, because I think the two guys that competed the hardest in this game and that played the best game after reviewing the game a little bit were Mac Jones and Christian Barmore who are two rookies yeah. on the team. And you talk about Alabama hunger, you talk, championships. You talk, yeah. You talk about wanting to prove yourself in the league and wanting to take that next step. Guys like Dante Hightower, Devin McCourty, Slater, uh, they, they've already done all of that. And I think that they've talked about wanting to be a part of the next guard, not wanting to be a part of the the years after Tom Brady and, and making this segue and, and, being on the next great Patriots team. But I think Bill Belichick is going to have to have a realization that some of these guys are frankly not going to be on the next great Patriots team. Like I think Devin McCourty still has a good role on this team moving forward. I think that he's by far their best option. Just looking at the free safety position for 2022, they're not going to get a better player in there than Devin McCourty in one off season, whether it's in the draft or it's a free agent, McCourty is going to be the best free safety that they could employ on this team in 2022. So maybe he sticks around and for another year or two, but yeah, I think that they need to allow some of these other younger players. I think guys, you know, for instance, JC Jackson's a free agent, but I do expect them to at least tag JC, if not reach a long-term extension with him. Maybe he becomes more of a vocal leader or a tone setter for that defense. 26 year old second team, all pro, you know, somebody that's probably the best player on the team, maybe, or one of the you know top two or three players on the team. And you start to talk about guys like JC Jackson and Christian Barmore 
and Kyle Duggar and Mac Jones and uh, maybe a guy like Kendrick Bourne, who's been a very vocal leader and energizer bunny for the offense and uh, Ramondre Stevenson and Damian Harris in the backfield who are two of their better players. These are the guys that I think are going to have to elevate that leadership role and, and sort of take it from there. And there's a whole other conversation too, not only from a player perspective, but from a coaching perspective too, just, who is the the coaches that are responsible for some of these things going wrong, especially on the defensive side of the ball is an extremely touchy subject uh, right now in new England, because one of them is obviously Steve Belichick, yeah. Bill's son. Uh -huh. And the other one is Matt Patricia. Who's the eye, eye in the sky during the game, sitting in the coach's box and helping run the defense as well, who are two, his son and then patricia who's one of his confidants yeah. for years right one of his 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 binkies if you will for a very very long time even in, though he left for the couple of years has been belichick for years in new england outside of those couple of seasons that he was with the lions so those are two guys that did not coach well this year did not run that defense well. The defense got worse as the season progressed. What about Guys Mayo? faded. Mayo is, from what I understand about Gerard Mayo, is he is extremely frustrated with the hierarchy on the coaching staff because he feels like Steve has done nothing to prove that he should be the de facto play caller, defensive coordinator, whereas Mayo is somebody that, the players connect with uh, had played in the Patriots played, yeah. defense, you know, all these things kind of point to Mayo being a more cerebral, better fit as that sort of thing. But he does a lot of stuff for the coaching staff. Like, don't get me wrong. It's, it's definitely a committee sort of thing, but eventually the buck has to stop somewhere. Sure. And if I look at it, I would say that, you know, the hierarchy Mayo is probably on the bottom of, of the hierarchy. Steve is probably second to the bottom and then it's Patricia and then it's Bill. And I don't know if that's working at this point. Right. I mean, I think that having one clear voice yeah. and having one person that has the direction and the best interest of the defense, you know, the defense hasn't been the same since since Brian Flores left. And in the 2019 season, first half of 2019, they beat up on a lot of bad teams, but they were more or less running Flores' defense from the year before, and they were just calling the plays that Flores okay. was calling the season before. Now it sort of became its own thing, right? They've uh, the, These guys have sort of taken over and changed it up. And I think that you see some of these free agents on both sides of the ball that came in last offseason uh, talking about, Matthew Judon, for instance, who had 12 and a half sacks in the first 13 games and then zero sacks in the last five. He had COVID. He had a rib injury. Maybe some of those things kind of added up on him. But if I'm Matthew Judon, I'm looking at it. I'm saying they're dropping me into coverage. I'm the best pass rusher on the team. Yeah, it's silly. Why am I not pinning my ears back and trying to get after Josh Allen every single play? Yeah. What am I doing in, in this zone drop? And now I'm in space and Josh Allen's scrambling and he's running right at me. I'm 260 pounds. <laughs> yeah. Like what is going on yeah. here? And then I, I think you also look at the other side of the football with a guy like Johnny Smith who you gave $32.5 million guaranteed to, and he has one target in the playoff game. And I think if you're Johnny, you got to be thinking, why the hell did they bring me here? <laughs> yeah, right. Right, like, it, it, why did they, like, look, I'll take the money, but yeah. I also want to be a good football player, and I, I don't want to go out like this. You know, I don't want to just be one of those guys that's known for being a bust or a terrible contract or a terrible signing, and they didn't integrate him into the offense. They didn't use him in the offense down the stretch at all. And then the playoff game, which if you talk to people within the organization, playoff games and end of the season, that's sort of your final exam in Bill Belichick's mind. That's, you know, in college, that would be 25% of your grade or something like that for the season. And they thought so little of Johnny Smith that he didn't touch the ball yeah. in the game against the, uh, the Bills. So at some point in time, I think you have to look at some of these free agent additions, these veteran guys that they brought in. And Nelson Aguilar and Johnny Smith and Matthew Judon down the stretch have to be shaking their heads and wondering, why the heck am I here? Yeah. Like, they paid me all this money in the offseason, and they're not 
I'm not being used to the best of my abilities. I'm not being used at what I'm good at, or I'm just blatantly not being used at all. It's a disconnect it's, it's, that we see a lot between yeah. the guy who makes a decision with the roster and then the coaches that coach these players. Right. I'm giving you talent, but wait a second. It's not fitting my scheme or it's not fitting right. what I thought you were bringing the player in for. So th that's surprising. Why do you think, who, who do you blame more that on? Do you blame well, that on Belichick? Because he's obviously because making the it, roster it, decisions. It, it's all, it's all the same guy, right? I mean, more or less, it's all the same guy, Yeah. especially on the defensive side of the ball. The guy that's picking the groceries is also doing the cooking. So I, at some point in time, you do have to look at Belichick on it. And I think one of the things that I look at with the offensive side of the football is not necessarily the fact that it didn't all come together in year one because they made a lot of progress. And the guys that they signed in free agency really helped them out this year. Like, they don't go on that seven-game winning streak without Matthew Judon. They don't make the playoffs sure. without Matthew Judon. They don't make the playoffs without Hunter Henry and Kendrick Bourne and Jalen Mills and some of the other guys that they brought in. But the problem is that I see with this team is that those guys are now still all under contract at a huge cap number going into next season. So you have these albatross contracts for guys like Johnny Smith. Nelson Aguilar is a $15 million cap hit next year. So there's nowhere to... How he many catches even did have, he have? I, did like, he have 15? Yeah, I think yeah, I think he had something like thirty or forty okay. on uh, catches Very on quiet, the year. Thirty or forty. Yeah, so they're paying him fifteen million dollars to run wind sprints on the outside and just stretch the field, which is a useful role. Sure. Don't get me wrong. And if you can take the safety with you, then it's a very useful role to open up the middle of the field and open up the other guys for single co coverage and all that kind of stuff. Is th there's something to be said for that from Nelson Aguilar? It's not worth fifteen million dollars, no. no. but there's something to be said for that. And the problem is, is you look at Nelson Aguilar's contract, and there's only one year remaining on the deal, so you can't move the money into the future you can't cut them because of the dead cap against your cap nobody's gonna trade for that number so you're stuck with it and with john U. smith it's the same thing but it's actually even worse because he's on a four-year deal so his cap hit next year is huge they can't move it they can't trade him they could convert his and restructure the deal and push the can down the road but now you're just increasing his future cap hits in 2023 and 2024 now we're getting sort of into the minutiae but the point being is that at least at this point in 2022, the Patriots are stuck with Nelson Aguilar and Johnny Smith. Like those two guys are on their payroll and there's nothing that they can do about it. So when we start to have conversations about going out and trading for a Calvin Ridley or signing a, another star wide receiver or adding a cornerback to pair with JC Jackson so that they're not going into a playoff game with Jawan Williams and Miles Bryant out there with JC, it's very, very difficult to do unless they're going to do it through the draft. And they've had issues drafting those positions at the top of the draft. So I, the only path for the team is through at this point. They have to hope that in year two that they can figure it out with the, a lot of these guys that busted in year one out of that free agency class and hopefully put it together with another strong draft class and hope that it all just continues to rise and get better. Because I, right now I don't see an obvious way for them to go out and sign Devonte Adams sure. or make some splash move that will really change the complexion. I would think that Aguilar would be a lot easier uh, to have him fit in because again, it's more of worst case scenario. It's still a part of your offense that should be effective. Even if he's not catching more than 30 passes, right? It's just look. Yeah. Did you overpay? Yes. But at least there's, there's reason to have him on 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 the roster and, and, and sure. on the scheme. It's John o. Smith. That's the yeah. one that has got to be okay. Well, can you think of anything where it could? Because we could only blame as as good as Mac Jones played. We can only blame a rookie quarterback on so many things because you can't blame Mac Jones on 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 a lot of stuff when it comes to talent. Like a Janu, like, why are we not getting the ball to Janu uh, or, and or Hunter Henry because of a rookie quarterback? Well, that can't be right. the case at this start, stage of the season. And I know that because of watching Zach Wilson play all season. And if right. he can get better, 
with the crop receivers they had towards the end of the season to start making throws and making these guys look like they're quality NFL receivers, then I know Mac Jones can do the same thing with John O. Smith. So it's just a matter of figuring out a way of, you know, did they underutilize him because they had a rookie quarterback? Uh, and is there a way for us to rescheme him back into the offense? Yeah, it's one of those things where if you're Bill Belichick and you're Josh McDaniels and you're in free agency last March, if you're going to pay a guy $30 million guaranteed and $50 million over four years, there has to be a clear-cut plan of how you're going to use that you should have You should have known that already, yeah. Right. Like, he needed to sit down with himself, Bill, and Josh McDaniels and said, if we get Jonu Smith, we're going to use him in – X, Y, Z, and it's going to be productive. It's going to be overly productive. Now, the one thing that really, really shocks you is the Patriots were bottom five in the league in usage of two tight end sets. They barely ran 12 personnel. They barely ran Hunter Henry and Jonu Smith on the field together because of the struggles that Jonu Smith had. It wasn't a productive package for them. You know, it was very, they don't have a ton of speed on the outside. So you have two tight ends that are not necessarily burners either. So you're putting Johnny Smith and Hunter Henry in a back and Jacoby Myers and Kendrick Bourne and Nelson Aguilar out on the field together. And you're recognizing we are just really slow. You know, we're really well, slow true. everywhere. Yeah. And I think that that's a big part of it as well as yeah. why they couldn't get, because Johnny was a, a guy that you need to scheme open. You need to get him in space with the football sure. in his hands on check downs or screens. And it's funny that the usage that John who looked the best and I know it's the Jets defense and I, I know that that's, you know, has to be mentioned, but in week seven against the Jets, he, he, in the first half, he made some really good plays in that game and they lined him up at fullback. They ran a play action pass and leaked him out of the backfield from the fullback alignment. They lost, you know, the Jets lost him in the coverage coming out of the backfield and they threw him a screen, a tight end screen in the flat. And those types of plays were what I expected the Patriots to do the rest of the season. Once I saw it once, I was like, oh, here, here is the Janu package. Like, here's the Janu sure. uh, scheme stuff. And it never came back. It just never came back. They threw him a screen. At, I think it was against Buffalo in week 16. You know, they threw him some screens here and there, but it, it really wasn't a a vocal point or, or an emphasis of their offense to get him involved. And if you're digging up that much cap space and Nelson Aguilar and Johnny Smith next year, I believe combined for $30 million <laughs> against yeah. New England's cap, yeah. they have to figure out either a way to, to get out of the contract or they have to figure out a way to implement those guys more on the offense and make them more useful for the scheme and for the offense in general, because uh, that was a big, big problem that they had. Well, well maybe, and Look, uh, these things happen when it comes to Jamison Williams' injury, where a guy that would have been in the top 10 is now going to have to slip. I'm sorry. But when you have yeah. really good receivers like Burks and London and Wilson and Alave, there are going to be some teams that are going to go, I don't want to pass on those guys for Williams, if I don't know if his knee's okay, I don't know if he's going to play for us for two weeks and his knee's going to go off again. And I, I could have had Burks, you know, I right. could have had London. Right. That's going to move Williams down, down the draft order, which puts him into a situation where the Patriots could pick a guy like that. But also don't you think if they add a receiver with really elite speed, that could open everything else up in the offense, including so, for John who. Right. So obviously a guy like Jamison Williams uh, fits the bill of what the Patriots need to an absolute T. And I like to call guys like Williams a three level burner. It's not just the big plays over the top. Oh, no. It's the fact that he can run with the football. You can throw him passes at the line of scrimmage yep. and watch him run with it. You can run him on a jet sweep or a motion and then put the ball in his hands and watch him go. You can hit him on a slant and watch him take it 80 yards to the house. You can throw it over the top. So three levels of, of speed with Jamison Williams. The, as a player, and I think he has some inside-outside versatility as well to play out of the slot or at least play from a condensed alignment if you want to go that route too so that you can feed him passes in the middle of the field. So Max not throwing a nine route on the on the sideline all sure. the time to him so there's other ways that you can get him he's the perfect fit for what they need yeah. in terms of that the concern that i have with it is that the patriots have the most complex playbook in the nfl and they have route trees that are very 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 particular 
and built on chemistry with quarterback and receiver. If Jamison Williams gets drafted by the Patriots, he's not going to be at training camp. He's not going to be at OTAs. He's not going to be at mini camp. And he's going to be starting from scratch in September or October when the train is already moving, yeah. when the you know the train has already left the station. And what we've seen in the past, regardless of how talented physically you might be, with your when you're with the Patriots and you're a skill player in the Patriots offense, once the train is moving, it's very, very difficult to get on the train. So my concern with Jamison Williams is that he's going to have a ton of expectations as a 21st pick in the draft, 4-2 guy. Everybody in New England is going to be like, he's the savior. We're all set. You know, we got this all figured out. Now we're going to get to October and November. He's not going to be on the field. Yeah, He's not going to be on the field. Yeah. And then we're going to go into year two, and everybody's going to put the weight of the world <laughs> yeah. on Jamison Williams' shoulders because they're going to say, well, we were patient. So now it's go time, right? You have a full training camp. You have a full summer. Now it's go time. And if he doesn't perform in the first two seasons of that rookie contract, then it's the same situation as what happened with Nikhil Harry. Well, and once let me just once the train that. leaves the station, it's very difficult to jump on here in New England. Uh, yeah, it's good good uh, comparison. All right, so let me ask you then: if, if if those four receivers are available, you personally, yes, would you rather take all four of them before you take? Williams with the injury. Oh man, it's tough because he's so he's so talented and he's exactly what we've been clamoring for with the four two speed and and the ability not you know like I said to not just win down the field but win at every level and I don't know I think a guy that I, I would stand out and and say is somebody that really fits what they stylistically like to do would be like a Chris Olave from Ohio State who is just a great blend of route running and explosiveness right he's got enough explosiveness maybe not going to run a 4-2 but he'll probably run in the 4-4s four sure. or so low 4-4s four oh, or something enough. like yeah. that yeah and he's got great route running technique a great feel for the middle of the field and I look at a guy like Olave and I see somebody that would translate really nicely into the way the Patriots like to use what's their Z receiver position, a guy like Julian Edelman's role or somebody maybe a little bit more down the field in, in a today's version of Julian Edelman's role, right? You know, you don't run the little quick hitters as much anymore. Sure. Uh, you know, in this to the NFL is more wide open. So I look at Olave and I, I see a guy that could really fit that type of you know, kind of way that they like to play. I like Jahan Dotson a lot from Penn State too, as a, maybe like a poor man's Jamison Williams, right? Like if you want that speed and you want that burner type, he can do some of those things. Guys like London, guys like Traylon Burks, those guys scare me for the Patriots because they're more sized sure. players, I can see right? That. Yep. And I, I look at a guy, especially like a Traylon Burks, who's extremely talented, but he gives me Nikhil Harry vibes. He just, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. he's. He's a big jump ball yeah. receiver that doesn't necessarily known uh, for having great route running technique. Well, and that's stuff true like too. That. The route running, we and and the thing with what drives you crazy when you're trying to analyze these guys is you really can't analyze the skill position players or specifically the receivers until after right. the combine. You yes. got to know what they're going to run. It's, yeah, it's, it, it's it's everything to these receivers. So yeah, it feels like the Patriots in the past. And I, I hope that these days are over. And the guy that is interviewing a couple of different places, I think the Raiders interviewed him today for their general manager job, is Dave Ziegler, who I am really high on. He's the Patriots' de facto GM. He replaced Nick Casario as the director of player personnel. And it seems like over the last couple of drafts, and maybe this is a disconnect between how their players are going to be used and who's drafting them and all that kind of stuff. But at least with Ziegler at the helm, it seems like, besides the Matt Jones pick, which was obviously a stylistic thing, uh, explosiveness, athleticism, uh, play speed, those things are becoming a factor again in the, who they are drafting. Guys like Duggar, Christian Barmore, Josh Uche, uh, those players are explosive players on the field. They're fast. They play at a different pace than everybody else at their position. And those are the types of guys that I hope the Patriots are going to start gravitating towards because the biggest concern that you always have with the Patriots drafting skilled players, at least in recent years, is you draft the Nikhil Harrys, you draft the Sony Michelles, and the speed just doesn't translate. Sure from the college game to the pro game. And they're drafting a wide receiver, Nikhil Harry, who runs in the low four fives, is six foot three. It's just, it's not a fit. It's not a stylistic fit in the type of offense that they like to run. So to me, 
uh, getting some, first of all, if he's got a four five ahead of his name on the 40 <laughs> yeah, no, right, and scratch yeah. his name off, I would even say if he's got a four, four, nine on the 40 sure. scratches, I, I want low four fours and below. If you're going to draft a receiver early, if Absolutely. I'm the Patriots, no doubt. So, but hey, look, don't sleep on the defensive needs also. Right. I mean, the defense has holes to fill too, but they got to find the thing I keep on coming back to is not necessarily ignoring the fact that they have needs on the defense side of the ball. But when you have guys like Josh Allen in your division and you have Patrick Mahomes in your conference and Joe Burrow in Cincinnati in your conference, you're not going to win games 20 to 17. No. You're just not. So as much as you want to build up the defense and as much as you want to improve on that side of the ball and as badly as the defense played in the last two games against Buffalo, and that has to be a big part of your offseason focus – being able to keep pace with these offenses in the AFC and being able to win a game in the 30s is also something that yep. you have to wrap, be able to wrap your head around. And right now, the Patriots do not have the firepower on offense to be able to compete like that. Like, they just couldn't keep up with Buffalo. And, and that was really... Look, if they start going toe to toe with the Bills and yeah. Mac Jones answers the opening drive by Buffalo with his own opening touchdown drive and it's seven seven instead of fourteen nut like who knows, right? Who knows how that game changes? But the fact that they cannot keep going toe to toe and the defense has to essentially hold everybody to twenty points for them to get a W, uh, that's a big concern. Yeah, let's uh let me take a look at our t- our lads roster depth chart uh, for the Patriots here. You don't need to look at it because you know this roster like the back of your hands. But uh, let's let's look at that defense. So you got uh, up front, and I'm just looking here uh, at the front seven. And just looking over this, you got as for, like names that stick out. Okay. I've got Judon and I've got Barmore and I think and Uche. Yeah, And I think I stopped there as far as guys that, you know, where you just look at it and you go, okay, that guy is either already an impact like Judon right. or Uche's got potential and Barmore's got potential. But other than that, sure, you have a mix of good players, solid players, but you don't have right. – that's all you have because Winovich right. did nothing this year with the injury. And I don't even – you no, tell me what's going on with him. He's probably one of the tro- t- top trade candidates – I would say going into the off season of maybe a, a four, three team or a three, four team. That's a little bit more aggressive with their outside linebackers would give the Patriots a mid round pick for a guy like chase Winovich. I think that they would make that deal tomorrow if they could at this point with Winovich. I think that that one will definitely be okay. shopped. I think you mentioned two guys though, Judon certainly and Barmore who I do think can be blue chip, building blocks yes. for you on the defense, right? Pillars uh, of, of the defense, especially a guy like Barmore, who uh, not only do I just love how he plays, I love his attitude too. Like he's a no nonsense, like type of guy where he comes to the podium and he knows he's a bad man, right? Like he knows that he's freaking good and they need more of those types of guys that are got a little nasty to him, got like some confidence to him. And I, I really like that so much from Barmore where he just said, you know, people, we would ask him when you get single blocked, like what goes through your head when you have a one-on-one and he goes, you're going to feel my pain. You know, like you, you're like, you're, you can't block me one-on-one. Yeah. I know you can't block me one-on-one. That type of confidence is like the type of thing that Patriots defense desperately needs. And I think the three pillars, I always say that, you know, good defenses, you need like four good guys, four pillars, right? Four blue chip type players. I think that they potentially could have that with Judon Barmore, J.C. Jackson, and Kyle Duggar if Duggar takes that next step. He already took one step this year. If he takes another one next year, I think that those four guys are potential Pro Bowl-type players in the next couple of years if they continue down this trajectory with those four. And then as Bill Belichick always does— fill in with good role players, good scheme fits, good, you know, kind of classic Belichick type of players everywhere else. But the one other spot on this defense that screams needs to upgrade at me is the outside corner spot opposite of J.C. Jackson because the Patriots run a scheme that's such man heavy. It's so There's so much man coverage involved. And 
if they're going to play that much man coverage, then you got to have the horses in the back end to play to hold up in man coverage that much. So when I look at JC Jackson, I think that he's a must resign or at least a must tag. You can't let that kind of cover talent walk out the door when Jalen Mills is your number one corner on the depth yeah. guard if he leaves, right? Like you just can't have that happen. So I look at this secondary and I look at what the Patriots had in 18 and 19 with Gilmore and Jackson and John Jones and Jason McCourty. And they had so much depth at corner and they had so many guys that could play man coverage. And that's what I want the Patriots to build in the secondary. Now they're, they're close. They, they're missing, you know, that number two guy that can push Mills into more of a Swiss army knife type of role where he's kind of like a quarterback safety hybrid and can do a couple of different things for them in the back end. Jack of all trades sure. instead of putting him out on the boundary constantly as an outside corner so if they can go out and they can get you know the move the, the, the kind of often off-season blueprint that i would look at if i was the patriots would I, I would try to make a move in the veteran market for a wide receiver i just don't know if i trust them to draft uh, and develop a wide receiver early in the draft again so is there get, enough are there enough veteran right wide receivers though with the with the prerequisite speed that you'd yeah, be looking that for. I don't know. Um, that I don't know. But if you can go out and you can get a guy like a Calvin Ridley, I, I think you have to make that trade. If yeah, you're well, new yeah. Hey, if you can go ahead and you can trade for a, a player. Look, I, this happens every off season. Who's this Stefan Diggs? Who's the Deandre Hopkins? Who's the guy that's unhappy where he's at? Sure. Right. You know, you need to be at the front of the line if you're the Patriots for those types of guys this off season. And then I would probably look to the draft to try to go ahead and, and revamp the defense because I, I trust Belichick to the, for the most part to be able to hit on some of these defensive guys in the draft. It's the offensive skill players that worry me. So you think then that the top two choices they're probably going to look at for the first pick is going to be either speed receiver or again, any of those four receivers we talked about will fit or a defensive back. Yeah, I would say cornerback, linebacker, receiver. Like, like a you, hybrid in the defensive backfield as well? Or do you think uh, Duggar's got that? No, I think outside corner outside would be corner. where they would go. Uh, especially if Jackson is back on a tag, and that's not a, a certainty that he's going to be a long-term uh, signing here in New England. Year. And, sure. You're right. So just be with a one year, then I would definitely look at them to pro pro probably draft a corner very, very high to try to replace JC Jackson or pair with JC Jackson. They need a linebacker for, you know, they need speed. They need youth at linebacker. Uh, it's a weird dichotomy with the linebacker position for the Patriots because they employ these 250, 260 pound linebackers because of the way that they set things up in their defensive front. They're not a penetrating one gap defensive line team. They are a two gap occupy blockers, eat guys up and then kind of uh, you know fit it all together from there. So if you have a, a two gapping system and you have a lot of pullers and climbers and stuff like that up to the second level in that type of scheme you can't have a 235 pound linebacker taking on a, a guard in the hole right sure. you just you can't have that so that's why they have the high towers and the bentleys and those types of players but what they need to do is they obviously need to look for a new age linebacker now you know no more 260 pound plotters you know guys that are just purely thumpers and look for somebody that does have some explosiveness and speed but also has that ability to take on blockers so that's probably a first round pick right you don't really find those types of linebackers on day two so linebacker corner I, I, again I, wide receiver is going to be on everybody's wish list in terms of fans i don't know if the patriots are going to view it that way i think all the patriots are probably going to try to sell the fan base on the fact that all these guys are returning for year two that they signed last year born Aguilar, smith henry and they're going to say we're going to keep the grip the band together Maybe we'll add a veteran free agent that we like, you know, somebody that's a little bit more realistic. That's not these dream Calvin Ridley's Devonte Adams yeah. type of scenarios and, and run it back essentially on offense and see where that brings us. And then defensively really go after that side of the football a little bit more. I, I, I love all the guys in the draft at wide receiver. I like Jamison Williams. I like Alave. Like I mentioned, I like Garrett uh, uh, from um, Wilson, Ohio Garrett Wilson, state. Yep. Yeah, I like all these guys, but they just have not been able to 
developed. Yeah, that it's, it's, yeah. I hear you. I, I, I can understand. It's a scary thing. Yeah. Especially if Jameson Williams, that really <laughs> yeah. does terrify me that that guy is going to come in here. They're not going to play him as a rookie because he wasn't healthy for training camp. And in year two, he's going to end up, you know, not getting it or not clicking sure. or, or something like that. And all of a sudden you're in exactly the position that you are in now. So I, I think that they tr- they took their swing with Nikhil Harry in the 19 draft. And when that didn't work out at wide receiver in 20 and 21, they didn't draft a receiver in 20, despite it being a need. And then in 21, they waited till the seventh round to draft Trey Nixon. They, I think they basically threw their hands up and said, we can't scout this position and we can't get figure this position yeah. out. So why waste another top 50 pick on a wide receiver uh, when we know that we're not going to do well with the pick? So I I think that they've kind of given up on wide receiver, honestly. Uh, One last thing with these linebackers, and then we're going to talk a lot more about the draft in the coming months. But uh, I'm going to go through my rankings of of the inside guys. Now, the Patriots are not going to get N'Kobe Dean. We know that. The Patriots are probably not going to get Devin Lloyd either. Yeah, um, but so let's go with the rest based on your what size you're looking for, and and then the rest of the guys that I think could go into the first round. Uh, Damone Clark from LSU is six three two forty five. Is that the size you think that you're looking yeah, for? Yeah, I mean that that definitely has enough size to it that at least he's the type of player that could maybe do a little bit of bowl. You know, I like, you know, Chad mama from, uh, yes, he's the next guy I was going to. Yeah. yeah. He's another bigger backer, right. That maybe one, yeah, six, three, two, forty two. Same yeah. as Clark almost. Yeah. Yeah. It may fit the bill of what they're doing. And, you know, it's funny because there was a, a lot of smoke and a lot of rumors last draft cycle. And after the draft, once all these things and start to come out about teams boards and all this kind of stuff that if Micah Parsons was available for the Patriots at 15, that the Patriots were seriously considering taking Micah Parsons over Mac Jones at that spot. And that's because a guy like Micah Parsons, who obviously I don't even think the Patriots could have predicted there was going to be this good. But the fact is, is that he's the type of player that can play their style, but also play it extremely fast. And that's just so rare yeah. to find that kind of player. So Micah Parsons don't grow on trees, sure. obviously. And, and that's not I'm not saying that they need to go out and draft a Micah Parsons because I don't think there is going to be ever be a Micah Parsons maybe again in, in the draft anytime soon. But 245, 250, okay. a, a guy that has some girth to him, yeah. but that can also run, I think is a big, you know, if they could like re replicate Jamie Collins 10 years ago and the 13 draft and put him in the 2021 draft and had draft a, a 22 year old Jamie Collins. That's the type of player that I think that they're searching for at that position right now. Yeah. Uh, I think the best uh, cover linebacker coming out uh, dome in, but he's not big enough. He's yeah. only six one two thirty. the kid out of Nebraska. Uh, so that's not along the side, but he, it'll be interesting to see where he goes because he's clearly the elite cover linebacker. I was shocked by the way, when Nolan Smith decided to return to Georgia, yeah. it's like he was to me, he was clearly the number one outside linebacker in the draft and he would have been a top 10 pick. Yeah, I mean, it's just uh, incredible. Now, look, I give him all the credit in the world because, and by the way, when he comes out, you want to get him no matter what team you are because the kid just loves football. And you love right. to have a kid like that. That he's got the, You're talking about a five-star recruit, all the talent in the world, went back to school when he would have been a top 10 pick. Boy, whoever gets him, they're going to be really, uh, really happy. But unfortunately, yeah. he's not coming out this year. So Yeah, I'll give you, you know, there's a really deep cornerback class. Yes. So I expect pretty much all those top corners to be on the Patriots board or on their, uh, you know, horizon sauce Gardner from Cincinnati. I think I like him. I actually like him over Stingley because I don't trust Stingley. It's almost like Jamison Williams. You love him, but can you really trust him because he's been injured? He's only played like 24 games in his entire career. So I, I love, I love Gardner so much that I'd rather pick Gardner over. I, I still have Stingley at two. But I'd much rather I feel a little bit more safe with Gardner. The only other guy that I would mention on the defensive side of the ball that we haven't talked about, and I I don't know if he's going to be there at 21. But if Jordan Davis somehow falls in the draft to that spot, yeah, well, pairing I, he him might be with, available. 
pairing him on the defensive line with Christian Barmore, <laughs> I think is something the Patriots would seriously consider. I think they would see a young Vince Wilfork and Jordan Davis and, and see that type of player that they could play on the nose and really be highly effective in so many different ways in their scheme from that position. And he's, you know, their defensive line could certainly use an upgrade, especially at that nose tackle position where Devon Godshaw wasn't exactly the greatest fit that they thought that he was going to be there and might be more of like a three, four end than a true nose. And I might even be somebody that might get cut if they end up using a high draft pick on a defensive lineman, because they can save some draft, uh, some uh, cap space by releasing Devon Godshaw. So Jordan Davis is a, uh, he looks exactly like a big, yeah. strong, uh, but still has some explosiveness and some athleticism to him. And I look at that Georgia defense and how good they were for this season in college football. And Bill Belichick is one of those people that when he really likes a defense in college football, he says, just give, I want somebody from that defense. It's like, I don't care who it is, but there's like four or five guys in this draft that uh, yeah. from Georgia on that defense, yeah. right. That, that could uh, c- cross his mind. And my guess is, is that if he, if that defense is as dominant in our minds as it, you know, in Bill's mind, as it is in all of ours, that he's going to look at that and say, I can't go wrong with taking one of these guys sure. from this Georgia defense. And uh, Jordan Davis is definitely one of those players. And if you're a Patriots fan, it's not the flash. No, it's not going to be a sexy pick. Means, no. But putting Davis and Barmore yeah. on the same line for the next five to 10 years is a really formidable duo. And uh, that's how this system runs the best is when they have a good defensive line. And I, I think that that would go a long way. Yeah, matter of fact, see, I, I think he probably will be available because you're still talking about a two down lineman more than likely. Right. And you're talking about a guy that usually those guys aren't taken at high. Because yeah. you want to yeah, take a three-down guy. That. As talented as he is, as crazy good as he is at what he does, we are moved past those types of players for a lot of teams in the league. The Patriots sure. still are, are archaic in a lot of ways, <laughs> the way that they design their defense. So yeah. they still have the, a need for a true nose tackle. Sure like that and I like I said I, I think they look at will look at Jordan Davis and they'll see what they saw in Vince Wilfork yeah. 15 years ago. And I think he'll be available. And, and the other thing too is I think he will go to a team like the Patriots, a team that feels they're only a year or two away from right. competing cuz a guy like that needs to go somewhere where you're 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 almost like a a missing piece to the puzzle. Right. You you can't be a, a team that's 4 or 5 years away from competing. It, right. He, he'd be a waste on a team like that. But yeah. a team like the Patriots would be And when a you're sitting there at 21, drafting for need at that spot is iffy because you might not be getting the top guy at that position. So if you're drafting at 21 and Stingley and, and Sauce uh, Gardner are already gone. Oh, they'll be gone. Right. Then taking the third corner off the board versus taking the number one D tackle on the board. Sure. You know, that's that depends on how, you, how highly you like that number three who would. Might be Roger McCreary from Auburn. Right. So depending on where they they fall on that guy, but that's the way that I I think that they think about the draft a lot of the time is, okay, yeah, like we might need a wide receiver. We might need a corner more than we need a nose tackle. But Jordan Davis is the best nose tackle that we've seen come out in the last three years. And this corner is good, but he's not elite at his position whereas jordan davis is elite at the position i think it's a big reason why they moved up to take barmore is because barmore is the first d tackle taken in last year's draft but they looked at him and they said this guy's an absolute animal like we need this guy on our team and I, and they make the move up to get him. So I, I they would rather instead of you know everybody else is thinking oh they're moving up to draft a wide Elijah Moore or something like that to pair with Mac Jones right yeah. they're like trying to move up for a wide receiver and they end up taking a D tackle because maybe they looked at their board and they saw uh, you know a guy like Elijah Moore who was already gone I guess at that point but you understand my sure. point who. You know, they look at the wide receiver board and they say, well, we could take the seventh best wide receiver or we could take the best defensive tackle. Yeah, and the Patriots prefer the talent grab. Yeah, that's the way you got to do it. And by the way, we've said it already if, about 10 times in the, uh, during the season. But uh, we, we're we going to call it here. I don't know what round, but uh, Akunle Farukasi is going to be uh, a uh, New England Patriot. What round? Uh, I can't tell you. But considering he's a Rutgers guy, 
Uh, and uh, we know how Shiano hasn't had a Rutgers guy this talented on defense come out in a while. Uh, he'll probably be a New England Patriot, maybe like, you know, fifth round type of type of pick. Yeah. So Shiano's back at Rutgers now. Yeah. So that's that's a really interesting one. Yeah. Right. Like that's going to be something that we're going to have to any draft eligible Rutgers player is now back on the radar for the <laughs> yeah. Patriots. The other name that everybody under the sun is telling me is going to be a Patriot is Slade Bolden from Alabama, who's you know, this year's Julian Edelman, Wes Welker type of receiver. OK. And uh, so I I keep on hearing, oh, they need to get Slade, Slade Bolden, Slade Bolden, Slade Bolden. And Slade Mac Jones Bolden. Is, okay. Yeah, Mac Jones and Slade Bolden had a little bit of a rapport last year at Bama as the third receiver there. And, uh, uh, yeah, you know, that's one of those guys, like, in the, in the fifth or sixth or seventh, you know, day three at sure, some point. Yeah. You know, you take one of Mac's yeah. guys. Yeah, you you know, should have, like, a, an actual a list like that. Here are, like, the top oh, we, five. Yeah. On on uh, on Patriots beat, we definitely will. Yeah. Right, we'll definitely have that list of these are the guys, and it's funny because people make fun of us and they say, "Oh, we say this every year," but a lot of the time we're right. Like a lot of the time, those Patriot style guys, and yeah. they end up actually taking those players. Yeah. You know, sometimes they don't. You know, like a guy like Hunter Renfro screamed Patriots, obviously uh, for many reasons, and they didn't end up taking him. But for every Hunter Renfro, you know, Mac Jones it screamed Patriots right at us, Alabama. Right. Had a stylistic fit, and and lo and behold, they made the pick. That's so, right. and sometimes it does work out. A uh, couple more things before I left you go. You mentioned you felt that some of the players on defense mailed it in. Yeah, who were those players? Oh man, I I don't know. I mailed it in might have been a little bit strong, <laughs> but I think that the what I saw in terms of compete level and buy-in towards the end. I mean, look, they lost four of their last five games. This wasn't just the Buffalo problem. And I think some of those guys, it, to me, it's not necessarily about naming specific players that mailed it in as it is. Are the Dante high towers, are these guys viable in today's NFL anymore? I think is a real conversation that the Patriots have to have because the issue that they had this year against Buffalo and in week 16, and again, obviously in the playoff game, they couldn't stop Buffalo's offense. There was a string there where the Bills went 14 straight possessions without punting against the Patriots defense between week 16 and the wild card game. Wow. So they had no chance against Buffalo's offense. And the two things that I come away from with that are one, the Patriots are a man coverage defense that has big dudes in the front seven, right? They have those big linebackers, big DTs, and they want to stuff up the run and they want to let their secondary do the, the, the heavy lifting in the passing game. If you don't have the horses in the secondary to play six man coverages there in the back end, then you have to play those linebackers in coverage to kind of cover up some of the other deficiencies. Sure. So now instead of having those linebackers fit the run or blitz or attack the line of scrimmage, like they're, they're going backwards. Yeah. Right. And the Patriots don't want their linebackers going backwards. Sure. They want their linebackers going forwards. Yeah. So either you need to build out that secondary and make that secondary a strong point of your defense again, or you need to adapt to what the rest of the league is doing. And you need to get smaller and faster in the front seven. Right. So that you can play zone coverage so you can rush four guys so you can do different things uh, to aid that secondary. So my guess is that Bill Belichick will be stubborn and he won't change anything. And he'll try to get more corners so that he can play more man coverage again yeah, and hold up in that direction. Yeah. But when I look at this Buffalo offense, not only do I look at it and say Josh Allen is not going anywhere. They're going to be a factor in this division for the, at least the next couple of years and maybe long term mm -hmm. in the division. And they are a spread and pace and fast and just great offense that they have to grow in there in Buffalo with a quarterback that can do everything that can throw the ball a mile, that can scramble, that can throw on the move, that can do all these types of things. And I watch this Patriots defense, which might be the slowest defense in the NFL, or at least close to being the slowest defense in the NFL. And I say they are totally not built to play Buffalo. And if they're going to win the division, then they got to start crafting themselves a little bit more to the Bills. And I look at teams like, for example, in the AFC North, you have teams that like the Browns and the uh, and the Steelers that are probably thinking in their draft rooms, the Bengals too, we got Lamar Jackson in our division. Sure. 
So we play Lamar twice a year. So we need to make sure that we have guys like a, 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 a well, Cleveland already drafted that kid from Notre right, Dame specifically right. for that that's purpose. Ex- right. That's exactly where I was going with this with, with joke. You know, he, I can't say his name, so I just call him jock. Uh, he, is the type of player that they drafted. And they literally said, we drafted this guy to spy Lamar Jackson. Yes. That's why we drafted him. And the Patriots need to start thinking in a Josh Allen world. They need to start realizing that Buffalo is a spread offense in the NFL. They run RPO, they run spread concepts from shotgun formations, and they spread out the field. They put a bunch of speed out there and they make you defend them. And the Patriots are not going to be able to defend them with 260-pound linebackers. They just aren't. So your two options are to get so good in the back end again that you can play man coverage with six guys. So you have five, you know, five on five, and then the post safety in the middle of the field. Or you get lighter, you get faster, and you play zone. Like those are the two things that you can do. But right now the Patriots are caught in between where they don't have the man coverage guys to play man, and they don't have the linebackers to play zone. So that's why they're getting shredded by Buffalo. So, well, by the way, that works against taking Jordan Davis, though. Oh, yeah. Jordan Davis is back to the old guard if you're Bill Belichick. And the same thing I was, a, you know, the comparison that I made when I wrote about this game on Monday was I, I have a great, great uncle. His name is Uncle Jerry. He's 95 years old. He calls me on his flip phone. I answer him <laughs> on my iPhone 13. The Patriots are the flip phone. Right. They they on offense want to run the ball there. It's 14 to nothing in the game on on Saturday night. And I'm hearing 71 is eligible because the Patriots are running six offensive linemen out there. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, they're trying to keep pace with Buffalo with six offensive linemen yeah. on the field. Like yeah. this is not good. Uh-huh. So from all sorts of perspectives on offense and defense, the Patriots are stuck in 20 years ago. And. I'm not saying that that can't still win. Like that's there, there is still a place in the NFL and there always will be a place in the NFL for physical football, right? For teams that are built out in the trenches and have good running games and can play that way. Just look at like Tennessee. San, right. Tennessee, San Francisco, like those teams might be going to the Super Bowl built like that. But if you're going to be built like that, you have to a be absolutely elite in that category yeah. those categories you can't be the eighth best rushing team in the league yeah. you have to be the best rushing team mm-hmm. in the league and number two you at least have to have some uh, offensively some semblance of a of a threat of a passing game like you have to have something in your passing game san francisco has debo and kittle uh the titans have aj brown like you have to have something that makes the defense think okay we can't just put 10 guys in the box and crowd the line of scrimmage yep. and get away with it so the patriots right now offensively i am dying dying for them to just be at the Alabama Patriots next year and get more speed on the outside and spread the field and allow Mac Jones to operate from the gun like he did at Bama and let him just control and let it be the Mac. None of this six offensive lineman crap anymore. Cause you're <laughs> yeah. not going to keep up with Buffalo like that. Yeah. Like, so what I, the way that I look at it, is that the six offensive linemen stuff, the run heavy stuff that had to be, that has to be a rookie year. Mac Jones thing. Like you have a rookie quarterback, you're trying to protect him. I get all that. Now that we're into year two and beyond a Mac Jones, it's time to open up the offense and time to put the keys in the rookie in the quarterback's hands, because that's how the teams are winning in the NFL. San Francisco might make a run here. Uh, I I would believe that the Titans, I think, are getting bounced. I don't know if it's going to be to the Bengals or it's going to be in the title game, but the Titans are not going to the Super Bowl. So unless Derrick Henry just absolutely gets on the field on Sunday and looks like he's in midseason form. Yeah, I just don't see their passing game being able to put up enough points if Buffalo or Kansas City gets in the title game. And I don't even know if they're going to be able to put up enough points against Joe Burrow. Uh, quite yeah. frankly, to, to win agree. that game. This could be a good game, sure. San Francisco is a different animal because their offense is so well designed for the way that they run the ball, and they have Debo, and they have Kittle, and they have these great playmakers uh, outside of just their running game. So that's a, a different animal altogether to me. But I, I don't think any of these throwback, archaic-style offenses are going to be the ones playing in the Super Bowl. And that's the been the calling card for years now right i mean where everybody says oh well you can still win like this N- not really you know, like, you know you what to- you know what really hurts though is a team like that it's like cleveland 
Cleveland and Baker Mayfield were so successful. Yeah. Year before, pre- uh, last year more than anything, running the football. No team better one two punch than the Cleveland Browns. Right. But what happened one month in? Hunt gets hurt. Right. A couple of offensive linemen get banged up. As soon as that happened, yeah. their offense went downhill. Because you can only have so many running backs at your disposal. If one of them goes down or one key lineman goes down, that's really a cu- couple of key, li- especially the running back, it-, it changes everything on your team. And it's very hard, therefore. See, with receivers, you know, you got five or six or seven on a team. With running backs, it's usually like you got two if you're lucky that you can right. really count on to run your system. And once Hunt went down, Cleveland's offense was never the same the rest of the season. So it's very hard to, and look at Derrick Henry. Once Derrick Henry was gone, Tennessee was lost for like about six weeks on offense. Yeah. I mean, I, it, I go back to the uncle Jerry comparison. It's like trying to beat a, a, a race car with a horse and buggy. Like you just, you can't win in the league like that at a high level. Yeah. Sure. You can make the playoffs. Sure. You can win 10, 11, 12 games like the Titans and the Patriots did, but eventually it's going to come down to my passing game against your passing game. And you look at the last couple of Super Bowl winners, you got the Bucks, you got the Chiefs, you got the Patriots, you got the Eagles, like, oh, keep going back. Like every single team over the last decade at this point was built through their quarterback or through their passing game. And I, I just don't think like the 49ers got so so close yeah. to being there and then they had to execute a drop back passing game late and in that Super Bowl and they couldn't do it yeah. so eventually I, when push comes to shove and you get into the fourth quarter of a play of a playoff game the title game the Super Bowl whatever it's gonna come down to your passing game versus the opponent's passing game and the pass defenses passing units yep. that's what's gonna really could control and end up uh, winning out in the NFL and uh, that's why my Super Bowl pick this year is, is Packers Chiefs, the the two best passing teams in the league. Now, do they run the football pack at the Green Bay? Absolutely. But they got Aaron Rodgers sure. and Devontae sure. Adams. Yeah. And that's the that's the foundation of their offense. So the Patriots are so far away from that on both sides of the football right now. And that's why they can't keep up with teams like Buffalo. And we talked it, it about just, that a few weeks ago is the, is, is the great job that Bill Belichick and the staff has done this season. Because if you looked at the roster. You just knew there were holes all over the place that they yeah. just aren't anywhere ready right now to compete. And and it showed on Saturday night. Yeah, I think next year is a big year uh, for Josh McDaniels and for Mac Jones and for Bill Belichick to point this ship in a direction that is a little bit more modern in how yeah. they are built. Because when the Patriots went to 11 personnel and they spread the fields with three wide receivers, they averaged over seven and a half yards per pass attempt. Like they, they were a good 11 personnel team this year, but they just didn't do it at the rates that some of these yeah. other teams do it at. They're 55% 11 personnel, whereas teams like the Rams and the, and all these other teams are like 75, 80% 11 personnel. So if you're going to be a, a throwback offense, against these spread teams against these wide zone teams that make all these explosive plays in the passing game again it's you're 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 a turtle and they're the hare. like you're you're hoping that you're just gonna end up crossing the finish line at the end because the other team gets tired or like you know craps all over itself or something like that you're not actually hoping that you're gonna win the game because you won the football game and and that's that's how the Patriots won a lot of these games this year. And it's different to were... do it in the regular season. And remember, we talked about it. How many wins did they have against backup quarterbacks? And they had yeah. one really good win against a really good team or a team that didn't even make yeah. the playoffs was the Chargers. So the writing was on the wall. And now it's yeah. about what are they going to do about it? Yeah, now they, like I keep saying, I sound like a broken record across all of my platforms and I, I, every show that I do. But what I keep saying is the same thing that I keep coming back to. If I'm Josh McDaniels, Bill O'Brien just coordinated the Alabama offense. We already know Nick Saban is Bill Belichick's best friend. Bill and McDaniels and Saban and Billy (laughs) O'Brien need to get into a room with the Alabama playbook in the offseason, and they need to start picking things out of that playbook. And and Nick Saban, give them Mac's five favorite plays from last year. Or ask Mac. And say, like, what do you like to run from this playbook? Absolutely. And put them all into the Patriots and update your offense. Like, you know, it it revolutionized your offense a little bit. Because right now, like, 6-0 line, 
21 personnel fullbacks, you know, all this kind of like, come on, like, you're not going to, you're not going to score 30 <laughs> know, points right? playing that type yeah. of offense. And you're not going to hold every offense to 20. So you can win every game 21 to 20. It's just not a winnable. Not anymore. It's not a winning formula anymore. No. It's just not. And by the way, we forgot about speaking of Alabama injured receivers, the actual receiver who had chemistry with Mac Jones. Mechie. Was Mechie. Yes. So right. he's not going to get drafted in the first round. So yeah. he's going to be. That's why I really do. The more that, I, and I know it, Patriots fans, just all they want is a wide receiver. They, they don't care about defense. They don't yeah. care about anything else. They just, because they, I, I think more than anything, they want to see it. Like they want the excitement uh, yeah, of Burrow that. to chase sure. or the excitement of, uh, you know, Mahomes to Hill. Like they just want to yeah. feel that, like the digs to Allen, you know, Allen to digs. Like they want to feel that, like all these other fan bases, you know, defense is boring. Like, let's let's be honest, like it might win more games, but it's boring unless you and have so, a really good defense. And yeah. very rarely does do you have a really elite defense, especially nowadays. Yeah. You know, the elite defenses are are now like what above average defenses would have been 20 years yeah. ago. So, you know, it, it's regardless of all that, the fans want to see a wide receiver. Uh, but I keep on stressing on the fact that I think this is a pretty deep wide receiver. Very class. deep. I think there's a lot of really good receivers that they could probably get on day two. And maybe it's Jordan Mechie. Maybe it's somebody along those lines on the, on the, oh, I really like Wondell Robinson yes. from Kentucky. He was be kind of like a Kadarius Tony yep. or, you know, uh, uh, somebody that can really uh, run around and, and do some different things with the ball in his hands. So I look at some of these guys on day two and I say, you know, maybe, maybe the route is using that first round pick on a corner or on a linebacker or on sure. a, you know, somebody to really another blue chipper on this defense and look on day two of the draft for a wide receiver because again i as much as i hate it to you know from an excitement standpoint and and just in general i am preparing myself for the fact that bill belichick is not going to take a big swing at wide receiver (laughs) because i think he's going to look at these skill players and say i mean dang i i forked over a hundred million dollars for those four guys last offseason i'm not going to just pull the plug after one year like let's see what this group looks like in year two i think it's the wrong approach but i think that that might be the way to go about it i can't imagine if they go through free agency and we get to the draft and there has not been one significant skill position player added to the roster that they won't use an early pick on one. I just, I'd be yeah. shocked. I think that you could get like the Mechian on day two. That's okay. I, I got no problem with yeah. that. I got no problem. With yeah. That. You don't I have to, it doesn't have to be the first round. It doesn't have to be. Right. And I, I think that that makes a lot of sense, but I think that they're going to look at this group and they're going to say that we're going to get more out of these guys in year two. And then yeah. if we don't, Nelson Aguilar's contract expires. Yeah. So that frees up that cap hold. Uh, Johnny Smith's contract all of a sudden becomes less years and maybe a little bit easier to get out of or move or whatever. And then we can kind of hit the reset yeah. button in 2023 instead of putting all this together on our cap in one year. Yeah, exactly. You know, we could maybe let it ride a little bit longer and see if we can get some. But the, the Ridley trade or, you know, some of these big moves that people hey, are talking you never about. Know. You never know. I just I don't know if they're gonna they're gonna go there just yet. Uh, by the way, uh, Anthony Jennings, just forget about it. What happened with him? Could he fit on Injuries. another team, or is he just because he looked so good in college? I know he was never a full time guy, but he yeah. was explosive looking in college. Yeah, injuries, injuries. Um, you know, he got injured in college at Alabama. He had that really bad knee yep. injury at Alabama. And that's and now you think he's almost like, uh, what's his name from Michigan uh, with Pittsburgh? Uh, he just picked off the pass. No, he held. Oh, Devin Bush. Yeah. Just like he has been nothing like he used to be because of the injuries. Yeah. Uh, I think, unfortunately, I, I have no expectations whatsoever for Anthony Jennings. To be honest with you, I don't have very high expectations for Josh Uche either. I think he's a really explosive player. I, I liked everything I saw out of Uche when they had opportunities to play him. In training camp, he was fantastic. He was one of the Patriots' best players on the field. And then uh, in the first couple of weeks of the season, he was really good too. And then he got hurt again fell off, didn't come back, never resurfaced. And uh, he's one of those players, and I, I when I talk to people at, at Michigan about him as well, that just when you think that he's about to explode and take off and, and, and be the star player that he clearly is in a package, right? Like you can tell that he looks like a guy that could really be an impact player. He gets hurt or something goes wrong, and the whole world comes crashing down around yeah. him. 
you know, the guys I talked to at Michigan said it was the same thing there. Every every spring, every fall camp, everybody was like, oh, this guy, Josh Uche, he's coming. Like, this guy's the next guy. This guy's going to be a stud. And then he'd get hurt, and they wouldn't hear about him for the rest of the year. Now, I don't know about hurt, but uh, speaking in Michigan, Ajabo, as a big Michigan fan, he would scare yeah. me to take him in the first round. He's he, he kind of reminds me a little bit of um, – the kid from Penn State that Baltimore took uh, at the end of the first round uh, this last year. Raw, a yeah. lot of talent, but people were talking about him being in the top 15. You can't take right. a guy like that. Top 15. He barely knows the sport. He played yeah. one year of FBS football. Um, yeah. That's the type of guy that I would, I, I wouldn't, you know, if you want to draft oh, him at that... the end of the first round and the second round, but I'm hearing those teams. types of guys sound like Bill Belichick written all over it. Now that you bring that up, because Bill's the type of guy that thinks that he can work with guys like that, right? Like if you have the physical raw tools, like yeah. I'll coach you up and I'll get you to figure it out. I, I mean, like, look, you know, I think Duggar's been a really good player for them, but Duggar's a D2 player, right? I mean, True. Lenore Ryan. And, and, you know, Bill still looked at him and saw the physical tools and was like, I, I you know, want this guy on my team. So, yeah, the, the, the one year FBS guys like that, the Patriots don't typically get too scared off by yeah. that kind of stuff. If they see the traits and they see think you can play, then they're cool with it. Yeah. Well, we're going to have a lot of fun talking about it. That's for sure. Yeah. And this wraps up our uh, 2021, 2022 coverage of the Patriots. Yeah. So the next time we talk, we've already gotten a head start. Of the 2022 yeah. off season, uh, yes. Evan, I appreciate your time as always. Thanks for being with us for the for the season as usual. You did a of great course. job, and I, I love talking football with you each week. Me too. Thanks, Greg. You got it, Evan.